Hey 7th graders, uh, we're going to work on looking at the War of 1812 today and the course of the events uh, during the first few years of the conflict. So at the beginning of the War of 1812, the Americans are really unprepared. Uh, it doesn't start out very well for the U.S. Um, the military wasn't ready to fight. If you recall, President Jefferson really uh, dismantled big parts of the military. He distrusted the military and want to keep it small, um, and whoever was left was pretty inexperienced. Remember, the American Revolution at this point is, you know, 30 years prior. Most people serving in the American Army and Navy have never fought in battle. They're pretty inexperienced, and the British have been at war forever. <laughs> They're always at war, and they have especially been fighting a war at this point with the French, so... <clears throat> They're pretty ready to fight. <laughs> um, most of the uh, early battles take place in areas around Canada. Yeah, the U.S. tried to invade Canada and take it over. Our friends to the north, the Great White North. But, yep. Yeah, it didn't go so well. We really got our rears kicked in Canada. Um, and we never ended up taking it. Uh, hence, why are two separate countries today? A lot of the action takes place actually on water in the War of 1812, and there's a lot of naval battles at sea and at lake. Yes, naval battles on the Great Lakes. Um, the U.S. Constitution was one of the most famous uh, battleships in all of U.S. history. Um, it is nicknamed Old Ironside since uh, cannonballs seemingly bounced off its sides. It was the the sides the the, the hull was so uh, tested. That the wood had become so hard from uh, battle, uh, you know, sailing on such rough seas, that it was able to withstand cannon blasts. Old Ironsides was able to withstand uh, five different battles and be victorious in all of them. Yay! You can see that today in Boston if you go on the Freedom Trail. Uh, it is a real pretty boat. Um, we also have uh, Oliver Hazard Perry. Um, I have met the enemy. Uh, he famously beat the uh, a larger fleet of British ships in the Battle of Lake Erie and pretty much got control of the uh, U.S. of the Great Lakes. Um, but the main thing that the, the Americans just couldn't contend with was the British blockade on the Atlantic coast, and this stopped them from getting supplies from the French, it stopped them from being able to uh, have trade or commerce, and it really was a... Uh, a, a difficulty for the Americans. This also then let the British start launching attacks on American cities. And that leads us to our next major problem. Um, the British were really upset uh, that uh, the Americans had burned down what was the capital of New Canada at the time. And not only that, uh, they were looking for some vengeance from the American Revolution. And they marched their forces up to Washington, D.C. And in this, they decide that they're going to basically sack the capital of the United States. Uh, burn everything that they can find. Take everything that they can find. Um, and among the buildings that were burnt and attacked include... The, what was being built as a Capitol building, um, and also the executive mansion, which we now call the White House, the President's House, burned most of uh, the sections of it to the ground. Some of it were still stand from that point. Uh, in fact, you can still uh, see fire damage in parts of the White House to this day. Pretty crazy. Um, First Lady Dolly Madison famously uh, secured copies of the Declaration of Independence and first copies of the Constitution, all sorts of things, as well as some of the famous portraits of the presidents, including the famous portrait of George Washington that you see here. He's like, hey, thanks, Dolly. See his hands out. And... Um, it was a, you know, was, she barely avoided capture. They, they said that when the British arrived in the White House, uh, that her food was still warm on the table. 
Imagine if they would have caught the First Lady. That would have changed things. The British then start marching up, and things look really bad. They're marching up the Chesapeake Bay, and they're pushing. And the only thing between the British and the major cities of the Northeast, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, um, basically crushing the Americans and winning the war, maybe even taking back possession of the continent, is this small fortress on an island in Chesapeake Bay called Fort McHenry that's outside of Baltimore. And the Americans in the fort are blasted by cannons all night. The British are trying to drive them out. And um, watching this is a prisoner of war, an American by the name of Francis Scott Key, who is standing on the battleship watching. He keeps waiting all night as this Fort McHenry is getting blasted, which most people would think the smithereens, by the cannons of these ships, um, waiting to see what's going to happen when the smoke clears and the sun rises and when the sky opens up and the smoke clears and the sun rises, the flag is still there, still uh, flying above Fort McHenry, a little battle-worn, but still up, showing that the Americans still control it and the British can't pass. In many ways, this is a pretty big turning point in the war, and it inspires Mr. Key to write a song that many people have trouble singing in key, the Star Spangled Banner. Fun fact, a Star Spangled Banner's music is actually not his. He just wrote the poem. The music is actually set to a British drinking song. Yes, the national anthem is set to a British drinking song. Do you know it wasn't our national anthem until the 1930s either? It used to be Yankee Doodle at one point. Can you imagine baseball games? Putting your hand over your heart and singing Yankee Doodle. Just not as dramatic. Anywho, um, one last thing that they talked about in the articles was the Creek War, um, which was going on in the southern states where uh, British forces were um, working with uh, the Creek Native Americans um, to come to try to persuade all the Native Americans in the southeast to join his confederacy. Uh, the Creek, for the most part, do, while other groups, other tribes like the Cherokee, don't. And they think that it's better to side with the Americans than the British. And uh, an American general who's going to be really important in our next lesson, Andrew Jackson, is going to be really important in a lot of future lessons, Andrew Jackson, um, leads the U.S. and Cherokee forces to victory after victory um, in the Creek War in the Southeast. Here's a fun bit of irony. Jackson fought alongside the Cherokee. The Cherokee chose to side with the Americans and fight against other Native Americans. In return, Jackson sent all of them marching from their ancestral homes in an act of genocide known as a, as a Trail of Tears when he was president. Good guy. So, we're going to do an art question today. Here is a painting of the Battle of Fort McHenry from the time period. And what I'd like to ask you is what elements from the song The Star Spangled Banner can you see in the painting? I'm also going to put a screenshot of the painting up with the, uh, with the uh, video lesson so that way you can go back and look at it or you can just pause it. Thanks for watching. Have a Star Spangled day.